as a poem in honor of Booker T. Washington by James Weldon Johnson in 1899 and set to music by his brother, John Rosamond Johnson. It is one of the most cherished songs of the African-American Civil Rights Movement and is often referred to as the Black National Anthem. Today, Black Capella will be singing this song with the Glee Club, and we encourage all of you to sing along with the music in your program. Tracy, you do the pole 
the treaty. And we'll take it from there. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2017 Otelia Cromwell Day. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> My name is Kim Alston, and I am the co-chair of the Otelia Cromwell Day Committee, along with Marilyn Lewis. The planning committee has developed a wonderful program for you today, and we are grateful that you are here celebrating Atelier Cromwell Day with us. We started celebrating Atelier Cromwell Day events last Friday. Some of you were there when you had the screening of Get Out, followed by a vibrant facilitated discussion about the film and last night, Smith alumna and writer in residence, Linnell Maurice, developed, I'm sorry, delivered a poignant performance of her love poems in Weinstein Auditorium. Today, you will have the opportunity to experience a dynamic, thought provoking keynote speaker along with diverse workshops and activities that came directly from your feedback the feedback that you gave to us last spring. Atelia Cromwell was a force to be reckoned with in her own quiet but commanding way. Her niece Adelaide called Aunt T her mothering aunt because she understood the importance of being a stalwart guide, role model, and dedicated educator for the next generation. This forward-thinking, intellectual giant was a civil rights activist before there was a civil rights movement. She served as a clerk for renowned Frederick Douglass and teacher in Washington, D.C. before she even stepped one foot on Smith's campus. She was not just a woman who believed in her convictions, but a woman who lived them much like you. Today we celebrate Atelia Cromwell, her pioneering status, her personal legacy, and her numerous professional accomplishments. At this time, we will hear a wonderful poem, Maven, by Tracy Williams, 2018 J. And Tracy will take the stage at this time and provide us with this poetry reading. Hello, I'm Tracy Williams, and I'm going to read Maven for Otelia Cromwell, 1874 to 1972 by Nikki Finney. Smith College commissioned award-winning poet Nikki Finney to compose a poem in honor of Otelia Cromwell. Finney recited the poem, Maven, during the Otelia Cromwell Day Convocation, November 10th, 2009. The poem is in three parts, and each one begins with a quote from Otelia Cromwell herself. Maven, genus, daughter. When you are a thinking woman, neither violence or sugar plums can muzzle the power of thought. Imagine, hatch, comprehend, apprehend. Know the inside and the out. You are just a girl when your mother dies. Left to tend the rest of the flock, you, the oldest, the one most like your father, taught to leave no stone unturned, marry thrift and industry while bearing your head in the stacks, sang foi, but never silent. Inquire, picture, ponder, think over, think and think again. Giddy with your own mind, 
Master everything is the family crest. No veil feigning, faking, guise, masquerade, or fanfare. There is a right way and a wrong. When you give your hand to the world, your responsibility? To have a mind, keep in mind, change a mind, and be the last to die. Genus, scholar. An educated group is a thinking group. Intuit, divine, check and recheck, invent, know the backward and the forward. You care nothing for the popular, even less for the slipshod. Your arms flower with all the leading out books, choosing wisely what and who trains you. Frankness, virtuoso, mastery, crackerjack. Think and think again. You leave college and university exceptionally prepared. You are complex and astute, as calm as a comma. No time for jewelry or parlor bows. There is a gold watch, a signet ring, a Smith College pen, white letters on gold just above the heart. Diligent, proficient, self-possessed, you weigh in with words to state your tolerance to the inefficient. You never back down from what is right. Young Adelaide is your dependable. And the ninth graders, leaning into your instruction, whisper, this must be college. You grade beautifully, but early. Genus, writer. The genius does not write to please, nor to marry. Veritas. Words pulled through a fine-tooth comb, then before you sleep, pulled through again. You refuse to segregate language from life, read German for sport, and swing golf clubs just to stay on the qui vive. You write of legality of taxes, pica out democracy, vow and edit for the integral Negro intellectual. Winnow, probe, sift through, Quest, think and think again. Solemnly engaged now to Lucretia and Thomas, you dislike being called doctor and remain forever keen on miss. What the dutiful trained hand can perfectly stitch delights you, unconventional and easygoing. Your desire never wanes to be put through the paces, edify, enlighten, to work, outward, from simple seam to monogram. We herald your bright hallmarks of first, those sprightly, high-waisted truths, the soft-spoken whippersnapper, eloping still. On April 8, 1874, Otelia Cromwell was born in Washington, D.C., the first child of Lucy McGuinn and John Wesley Cromwell. John Wesley was an accomplished educator, lawyer, and journalist committed to improving the material success, culture, and education of his community. Education, literacy, was personal power, economic power. And it was clear to blacks that you, you could not, in many cases, advance beyond a certain stage if you couldn't read, if you couldn't write, if you couldn't petition, if you couldn't organize. And so education, literacy, becomes very, very important. John Wesley Cromwell was one of the founders of the Bethel Literary and Historical Association, which was one of the leading forums of its kind. It was a debate forum, and there was a great deal of discussion 
of racial issues. It was a place that Frederick Douglass addressed, that W.E.B. Du Bois would address. John Wesley Cromwell was a great advocate for African Americans, and one can see how this would have to have a tremendous influence on Otelia Cromwell. Otelia excelled at her studies and graduated with honors from M Street High School, at that time the leading black secondary school in the nation. Following her graduation in 1891, she completed a two-year teacher certification program at Minor Normal School and taught primary and secondary students in the district for six years before entering Smith College in 1898 at the age of 24. I think these families risk regrets of color. They felt they had a responsibility to the family, but probably even more importantly to the larger community. So when you come to a Smith, you represent not just a family, but you are a black woman. That's a burden that you have to carry on both sides. When you leave, when you come here, when you go back. And what is it you're bringing back? What did you learn at Smith? The mission is not just for that family to live, but to live well and to bring about significant changes. It's interesting to think that at the time when Atelier Promo entered Smith College, it was already known as a distinguished liberal arts college for women. And at that point, when students entered the college, tuition was $100, room and board was $300, and they could choose between three academic tracks for study. They could choose between the classics, literary works, and the sciences. When Otilia entered and chose to enter a women's college, I feel that what Smith already represented at that time was an opportunity for her to expand her education in any direction she chose. Dear Papa, my courses are most interesting, but require such close and steady application that I do not have time for anything else. My most fascinating course is the one in 19th century prose. Miss Hubbard is considered one of the most brilliant of our alumni, full of enthusiasm and most clever and inspiring. Otelia's enthusiasm for her studies masked the paradox of her acceptance into Smith. While she participated rigorously in her academics, she was required to board off campus in a private home on Round Hill Road, distancing her from central campus and limiting her social contact with classmates. Otelia Cromwell came here to engage with her professors, to take advantage of the library, to take advantage of the facilities, to have a different view, a broader view of the world, but not to socialize, and she was not disappointed. In 1899, Julia Caverno, a professor in the classics department at Smith, invited Otilia to reside in her home downtown, adjacent to the college campus. The move offered Otilia a more integrated academic experience as described in a letter she penned home in the fall of her senior year. I'm having a very happy time of it this year. Being right down here, I can take advantage of so many more opportunities than when I lived up on Round Hill. I have very few quiet moments and have at times felt much fagged out, but I guess I am no worse for it. November 5th, 1899. In 1900, Otelia Cromwell earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Classical Studies, becoming the first African-American to matriculate from Smith College. In the years following her graduation, Otelia pursued an extensive post-baccalaureate education, earning her master's degree from Columbia University and a PhD in English from Yale University. Continuing her legacy of remarkable achievements, Otelia became the first African-American woman to receive a Yale PhD. When you think about Otelia Cromwell's fierce bravery, it really is an expression that belies the claims that were made about African-Americans and African-American women in particular. Claims that were racist about their lack of capacity or love of learning or training or education. And in fact, it did the exact opposite. It showed how brilliant and resourceful women from underrepresented communities were. Otelia Cromwell was a consummate scholar as well as an extraordinary teacher, and in 1930 was appointed professor of the Division of English Language and Literature at Minor Teachers College in Washington, D.C. In one of her articles, published in the Harvard Educational Review, Otelia spoke of the English curriculum as a space where her students could develop the power for contemplation. And she really believed that if we could communicate with each other effectively, then we will be able to move forward as a society. And so I think she was able to keep going, to persevere in spite of the segregated systems that she faced all around her, to know that what she was giving her students was more than simply facts, it was understanding. 
Dr. Cromwell remained with the Department of English at Minor Teachers College until her retirement in 1944, and then completed her most significant scholarly work, The Life of Lucretia Mott. The book, portraying the Quaker abolitionist and women's rights activist, was published in 1958 by Harvard University Press and continues to be cited by contemporary scholars today. Throughout her entire life, Otelia Cromwell was concerned with issues of social equality for all people. In the spring of 1944, she wrote an article called U.S. Democracy, Fact or Fiction. And in this article, she discussed the paradox of how we live in a country that espouses democracy for all, and yet the army in this country was segregated. The same people who were fighting to preserve democracy were not receiving it. She foresaw the coming of what would soon be the Civil Rights Act. In 1950, Dr. Cromwell was awarded an honorary Doctors of Laws degree from Smith College. Letters of support and congratulations poured in from former classmates and professors, and the citation noted her extraordinary efforts to communicate to her students a perceptive appreciation of literature. A deep commitment to education and social equality characterized Otelia Cromwell's life and work. Throughout her tenure as an educator, she broke boundaries, blazed trails, and opened dialogues for generations to come. Every year, the Smith community celebrates Otelia Cromwell Day, honoring the graduates' extraordinary achievements in education and her struggle for social equality. Speakers, workshops, and cultural events encourage community appreciation of difference in thought and outlook. While the current event promotes college unity, the origins of Otelia Cromwell Day lie within a series of racial incidents that occurred on campus in the spring of 1989. It turns out that all the black women in the house had received handwritten notes that were very carefully scripted poems in rhyme that identified biographical details about these women and that culminated in a threat to them, a threat of, of physical bodily harm. And I have never been more distressed in, than I was that day. It was not pleasant, it was not easy, it was not comfortable because somehow this ugly act had happened on a campus that was proud of, of its history and who we were, and here was this thing that happened that did not represent us, and then the whispers, or did it? This latest act in a series of racial incidents on campus fueled solidarity among student groups who organized rallies, candlelight vigils, and sit-in protests at College Hall. My whole senior year, we had a, a committee that was formed that was called, it was part of the diversity effort at Smith College to think about issues of diversity, but also to seed something that was going to be important, that was going to allow us to remember that we were a community that came together, that we are a community that was not gonna let racism stand, that we did not allow hatred and bigotry to exist on our campus, that that is not who we were as Smithies. That's where the idea of the Otelia Cromwell Day came from. On November 9th, 1989, the first Otelia Cromwell Day was held, providing the college community with an opportunity for education and reflection about issues of diversity and racism. The world is organized in complicated ways, and sometimes those ways aren't meant to be in everyone's interests. So how does classism and racism and all the ways that we think about the world get in the way of how we relate to each other as humans? Figuring out where we're coming from through events like Otelia Cromwell Day and through college, through reading, through learning about others, through you know, different media, through having conversations, that can go a long way towards helping us figure out not only where somebody's coming from, but where we can go together. It got to be made to appreciate the universalistic characteristics of this black woman who came to Smith College and how she carried that on throughout her life. She would not take abuse. She would not take discrimination, but she wanted to deal with it in a way that suited her personality and temperament. This is not about one culture. This is not about one race. This is not about just one person in particular. 
but you exist here because she was here. We are all a part of her legacy in one form or fashion, through race, through class, through culture, through being women in the world, trying to understand how can we be leaders in our own lives and in our communities. Whenever you hear a story about a person who was the first to do anything, as Otelia Cromwell did, it is so inspiring. And I think we take those stories with us and we use them when we need a little bit of extra courage. There's an old saying that goes, you have to know where you came from to know where you're going. And the history of Otelia Cromwell is part of the history of America. Her story is the story, quite frankly, of the democratic process of this country. Through her dignity, strength, and courage, Otelia Cromwell set an historic standard for achievement in education. Her example lives as an inspiration for today's Smith students to confront obstacles with determination, redress wrongs with certitude and persistence, and combat ignorance with intellect and vision. She wasn't confrontational, but she wasn't fearful. And she was gentle in appearance, dignified. What she said then is it's true now, that you must stand up for what you believe in, you must be independent, you must be caring, you must be appreciative and fearless. Good afternoon, everyone. This day is an important one for our community as we reflect on the legacy of racism in our country and here at Smith College. This is important because we continue to bear witness to the enduring power and tragic cost of institutional and interpersonal racism. Let us embrace the theme of this year's Otelia Cromwell Day program. We commit ourselves to resist, act, and persevere as individuals, as educators, as housemates, classmates, friends, and allies. As members of this campus community, as well as communities around the world. Ending racism, ending white privilege, ending white supremacy, this is our goal. And Otelia Cromwell Day is a visible sign of this commitment. I want to offer a few brief words of thanks to the members of the Otelia Cromwell Day Committee for organizing this year's program, to the members of Black Appella and the Smith College Choirs for raising their voices in song and for encouraging us to do the same, and to Tracy Williams for her inspiring recitation of Nikki Finney's poem, Maven, to Kate Lee for a powerful video that be has become an Otelia Cromwell Day tradition, just as this event has been a Smith tradition since 1989, when then President Mary Maples Dunn established the first Otelia Cromwell Symposium on Racism. Mary Maples Dunn passed away this past spring, but I know how proud she was of this event. As you know, each year we are honored to welcome Otelia's niece, Adelaide Cromwell, from the class of 1940 to our Otelia Cromwell program. Please join me in welcoming Adelaide, who will celebrate her 98th birthday later this month. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Roxanne Gay. She's an associate professor of English at Purdue University. She's also a writer, educator, and commentator, as well as a columnist for the New York Times. I always look forward to her columns 
In her writing about the intersection of identity and culture, she cuts through the noise and helps you see the truth. I will share two examples from recent columns. Following the demonstrations in Charlottesville, she wrote, I'm a black woman and I live in a country where the president does not disavow racism. It's 2017 and we're having a national conversation about the resurgence of white supremacy, American Nazism and fascism, or perhaps more accurately, we are being reminded that this hatred has been here all along. She wrote this following the Las Vegas shootings. It's hard to understand in this moment how some Americans are more outraged by NFL players exercising their First Amendment right to free expression by kneeling to protest police brutality and the fragility of black life than they are by mass shootings and the consistently shocking loss of life each time an angry man with a gun pulls the trigger. Her books include the novel An Untamed State, published in 2014, the essay collection Bad Feminist, also published in 2014, the short story collection Difficult Women, Just Out, and the memoir Hunger, released this year as well. Her voice is as clear and brave in writing about her own life and experience as it is when focused on issues in society at large. Atlantic Magazine assistant editor Adrian Green wrote this of Hunger and its author. By writing this memoir, she's exposed imperfections in culture, feminism, and herself that require any claims to humanity and dignity to make room for inconsistency. She doesn't try to reconcile how her critiques and failures intersect in ways that might seem contradictory. She allows herself to fall short of those aspirations and forms her own conception of her body and of healing. The title of her talk today is Roxanne with one N. I am so honored to welcome Roxanne Gay. Well, hello, Smith. How are you? I see we have a little affinity house action going on today. <laughs> I know about the affinity houses. I know all about them. So I hope you guys resist, act, and persevere on Saturday, November 4th at Hopkins House. It is a real pleasure to be here on Otelia Cromwell Day. I think it's an important day. Anytime a black woman accomplishes the kinds of things that Otelia Cromwell did, it's important to remember them and to remember them not only in name, but also in action. Of course, it's important for that action to last more than one day. And that's the trouble we have when we talk about diversity and inclusion. Oftentimes, we talk about it for one day or one month, and we think that's enough, and we can be on our own for the other 11 months of the year or the other 30 days of the month, and that's simply not how progress and change actually work. And so the title of my talk today is actually, <laughs> and there's a funny story behind the Roxanne Gay is one end thing. Well, A, people always spell my name wrong, but I'm not the kind of person who's going to plan something like months ahead, and so I'm just like, you can tell them the talk is whatever you want. <laughs> I don't know, because I haven't written it yet. <laughs> um, the actual title of the talk is The Age of American Disgrace. On Tuesday, November 8th, 2016, Donald Trump was elected President of the United States. I spent the evening watching election returns, and with each passing hour, the hope of Hillary Rodham Clinton as our first woman president faded a little more. But I still held on to some hope, because hope was much easier than facing reality. Although I do not think myself an idealist, I could not allow myself to believe Donald Trump could be elected. I believed at that time that there were enough good people across the country who believed in social progress and the greater good to overcome those who, for whatever reason, believed in Trump's harmful rhetoric. 
It has been nearly a year and still I am stunned. I am ashamed of being so stunned and so unprepared to face this American reality. The morning after the election, my mother called and I ignored my phone because it was seven o'clock in the morning, but according to Haitian parents, if you're not awake at seven o'clock, you have wasted the entire day. <laughs> I knew she was worried because we had spoken throughout election night and I was taking it hard. A few minutes later, she texted me, the sun is shining today, Miss America. We are alive, still together, and definitely stronger. Wake up. <sighs> Mothers. I did not want to wake up, or I wished that I was experiencing a nightmare and I could wake up in the world that we lived in on November 7th, 2016. An imperfect world to be sure, but a world where an orange reality television star was not president-elect. I did not want to wake up in a world where everything had suddenly become precarious for far too many people. On the Wednesday after the election, I went about my day. I had to accept that the world was not coming to an end, even though it felt that way. There were media interviews, even though I had no idea what to say. I had no way of making sense of the incomprehensible. What do we do next, I was asked as a black oracle, and what I wanted to say was, <laughs> I have no fucking idea. <laughs> I couldn't say that because you're not allowed to curse on the radio, but I sure did think it. While I was running errands, the sun was shining, the air was crisp, it was a perfect fall day, people were out living their lives. At my gym, everyone bantered as they usually do. The woman at the dry cleaner smiled and wished me a good day as she usually does. I kept wanting to scream, don't you know what's going on? At the same time, because I live in a fairly small town in Indiana, I looked at each and every person and thought, you probably voted for Donald Trump. <laughs> How could you? Do you have any idea what you've done? I didn't write a lot about the presidential campaign, and I regret that now. I wanted to, but I did not have the words to express my support and admiration for Hillary Clinton, or to express my frustration with the narrow field of candidates the Democrats offered, or to express my horror that Donald Trump was consistently overcoming shallow expectations. Uh, that's the official line. In truth, I was scared to admit how much I supported Hillary Clinton, and I didn't have the energy to deal with the inevitable blowback whenever a black woman dares to stand up for Hillary Clinton. I regret that now. It's not that I believe that I would have swifted, it's not that I believe that I would have swayed the election one way or another, but I know I had an opportunity to raise my voice, and I squandered that opportunity. Now, it is almost a year later, we have the president we have, and we cannot relitigate the election. Instead, I am interested in figuring out where we go from here. I am interested in figuring out how we survive this age of American disgrace. And let us be clear, to call what is currently happening a disgrace is my way of being polite. Eleven, ten months, eleven months into his presidency, Trump has set into motion executive orders to build a wall between the United States and Mexico. He has tried and failed and tried and failed to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, but continues to hobble it. He lies repeatedly. He has spent so many weekends at his Florida estate or golfing and discussing matters of, matters of national and international security with no regard for actual security. He has tried to ban Muslims repeatedly from entering the country and failed. He has ordered ICE raids on undocumented immigrants, specifically targeting sanctuary cities. His national security advisor, Michael Flynn, resigned because he had discussed sanctions with the Russian ambassador and then lied to Mike Pence. Flynn, if you missed it, led a vigorous chant of lock her up during the presidential campaign because, you know, Hillary Clinton in those emails. Flynn remains under federal investigation. His one-time campaign manager, Paul Manafort, has been arrested and indicted on multiple counts, including conspiracy against the United States. Trump picks fights with gold star parents. He seems to take particular pleasure in demeaning black women and picking very public fights with them. He has done this with elected officials. He has done this with the wife of a fallen soldier. He has largely ignored the tragedy in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and it's still not at all clear that he understands that these territories are part of the United States. In times of crisis, he is not a source of comfort. He cannot be trusted with the grief or anything related to the American people. 
Instead of focusing on the business of his country, he spends an inordinate amount of time on Twitter, airing grievances, taking pot shots at people he dislikes, and defending his utterly shallow existence. This is the man the United States elected for fear of a woman president and in retaliation for the first black president. Throughout the campaign, I thought a lot about language and how careless we get with words. I thought about language because I'm a writer and words are how I make sense of the world. There were all kinds of pithy catchphrases that became popular. Michelle Obama said, they go low and we go high. And for a woman in her position, that made sense. She was beholden to the role of first lady, and she was right in her belief that sometimes there is no need to sink lower than your opponent. But millions of people went on to parrot these words with no understanding of the world and how it really works. Too many people were and are invested in the idea of purity and infallibility to realize that there is no purity in fighting everything Donald Trump represents. There is no high road with a man who was appointed a white supremacist as his chief strategist and who continues to consult with him. When they go low, we have to be willing to go subterranean if we have any hope <laughs> or chance of resisting their greedy, shallow, <laughs> if we have any hope of resisting their greedy, shallow, insular brand of fascism. The phrase love trumps hate was equally loathsome because that is in fact not the case and over and over people were literally centering Trump. Language matters and sometimes it becomes an empty container for whatever nonsense people want to fill it with. Go high, Trump hate, be nasty, wear a pantsuit. The election results prove that love does not trump hate, not at all. As catchy as it sounds, I am not a nasty woman because there is no reclamation in how a man like Trump sees women. And while pantsuits are a charming and fashionable rallying outfit, they will not get us to the promised land. I don't begrudge people who found comfort or solidarity in these words and ideas, but my God, we needed to do better then, and we especially need to do better now. We need to get uncomfortable, and that means moving beyond tidy words that make us feel like the world is a better and more unified place than it actually is. Those of us in the crosshairs of the Trump presidency are devastated, but we must keep our eyes wide open, especially as the good white folk who voted for Clinton keep centering their whiteness every chance they get. They are ashamed of their country and they keep voicing their shame, but I don't want your shame, I want your fight. I want to hear your voices rising above the din. Not enough people with visible platforms are facing the ugly truth of what happened last year. The majority of white men and white women voted for Trump. Some feminists are shocked that white women would value their whiteness over their womanhood, but women of color and people of color in general are not surprised. The precedent for this can be traced back to slavery. What we're seeing is American racism and xenophobia and misogyny on full display. Trump voters can deny reality all they want, but with their vote, they consented, they consented to everything Trump stands for. They now have to live with the discomfort of facing themselves for who they really are. What is reaped must now be sown. I have also been thinking about the phrase identity politics, which is always used to dismiss the concerns and lived experiences of marginalized people and to derail conversations about how identity affects the way people move through the world. Identity politics is always an accusation that implies that we can somehow separate ourselves from the very things that contribute to who we are. It implies that we can't both acknowledge and embrace our identities and be part of a larger community. I, uh, thank you. <laughs> I am a black bisexual woman. I am a Haitian American. I am a Libra. That's really the most important thing about me. I grew up middle class and then upper middle class. I am fat. I am a very lapsed Catholic. I know little of safety. My identity is political because so much of who I am is part of the public discourse, subject to legislation, subject to discrimination and disadvantage. 
clearly, this is not the entirety of my life and who I am. Don't get me wrong, I've got it really good. In fact, the work I do is not for me. It's for the people who do not have the privilege I do, who need someone to stand and speak and fight for them, with them. This is how I must use my freedom to speak. February is Black History Month, and in February, and frankly every month of the year, I am invited to events like these with a vague mandate to speak on diversity. And <laughs> that wasn't what happened here. <laughs> and that word becomes another empty container that people fill with whatever bullshit they want. Basically, I am invited to talk to and teach white people about things that are largely pretty easy to figure out. I, like many people of color, am asked for solutions to problems I had no hand in creating. <laughs> I'm going to let you in on a secret. I don't know how to fix racism. I will be honest. I am so very tired of talking about diversity. I am so tired of the assumption that as a black woman, I somehow have access to some magical Negro wisdom about how to make the world a better and more inclusive place. The word diversity has, as of late, become so overused that it's often meaningless. In a 2015 article for the New York Times Magazine, Anna Holmes wrote about the dilution of the word diversity, and she attributed its loss of meaning to a combination of overuse, imprecision, inertia, and self-serving intentions. The word diversity is, in its most imprecise uses, a placeholder for issues of inclusion, recruitment, retention, and representation. Diversity is a problem seemingly without solutions. We talk about it and talk about it and talk about it and nothing much ever seems to change. This is another way in which we are careless with language, as if by simply saying the word diversity we're doing something or creating change. That's not at all how it works. Change requires intent and effort and material support, which in most cases is robust and long-term financial commitment. And always change requires a little or a lot of imagination, a willingness to think differently, react differently, and act differently. I've also been thinking about allies, and I am done with allyship, particularly, <laughs> particularly when the word ally is used as a noun rather than a verb. I am done with people allowing some, themselves the comfortable desistant, the. I am done with people allowing themselves the comfortable distance afforded by allyship. I don't want to allow myself that comfortable distance. We cannot afford distance anymore, none of us. The challenges marginalized people are going to be facing for the foreseeable future have to be taken on by all of us as personal. We have to fight for and with each other. Since last November, people have asked me, what do we do next? And I have no idea, but I am always trying to find answers to that question. I know we have to fight even if we do not yet know what that fight looks like. I know that we need sanctuary. I know we need to raise our voices and keep them raised. We need, as today's theme says, to resist, act, and persevere. We need to find ways to do this while honoring our hurt and our rage because anger is an entirely reasonable response to the state of the world. We as everyday citizens must participate in our local elections, our midterm elections, and the 2020 presidential election. We need to prioritize social and economic justice and use our privilege for more than just ourselves. We need to keep protesting no matter how exhausted we get because exhaustion is a luxury. We need to strengthen our communities by understanding where strength among us is most needed. We need to run for office, or at least you do, because I'm never gonna run for office. <laughs> we need to be disciplined and well organized. We need a whole lot of money. We need to protect ourselves and each other. Most importantly, when we use our words, we have to do so with care and intent. Words mean things. I have to believe that we are going to get through this and we will not only survive, but thrive. 
It is a fragile hope, but despite everything, I hold on to a little hope. I need to be able to breathe. We all do. I need to believe that there is grace beyond this age of American disgrace. Thank you very much. It's an absolute understatement to say that Roxanne did an excellent job. <laughs> and she's planning to take question and answers at this time. Um, well, actually, you will provide the questions, <laughs> and she'll be the one giving the answers. Um, if you would like, please come forward. Use your um, opportunity. Roxanne says she loves questions, so come and, and speak. There are Roxanne's microscope. Microphone. There are, there are mic oh, there we go. There are microphones at the front of the room. And um, it's very hard for me to talk about this, but um, one of the things that one of the things that I had to own myself as a privileged white woman um, was that uh, the collective shadow by Trump coming into the administration is a reflection of cultural narcissism, and that is that you know we can all whine and bitch about what we have or what we don't have, but if we're white. Um, we've been entitled to a lot of privileges, even as women. Um, I don't understand what happened with the election. I went down the way that you did, but the only way I know how to transform anything is to take responsibility for the shit that lives in me, mm -hmm. my own arrogance, my own inflation, my own narcissism, when I walk away from uh, homeless people on the streets here. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a very wealthy area, and I watch people parade up and down Northampton, and whenever I can, I give money, but it's just amazing to me we have a handful of homeless people and the money just doesn't come out of anybody's fucking pocket mm -hmm. and so i would ask everybody to look at themselves and at their personal shadows and the shadows of their own families and take responsibility for this shit. and maybe in that way collectively we can overcome our shadow mm -hmm. on the high side the enemy's directly in front of us i wanted to see him shot mm -hmm. you know but that's not, really the, that's not really the issue. The issue is that the ugliness is directly in front of me and I gotta deal with it in a personal manner. Mm -hmm. That's the only way I've ever known how to change anything. Mm -hmm. So I wanted your thoughts on that. Yeah, so you know, um, I think that it, it does start with, as white people, looking at themselves and looking at the people in their lives and starting to make hard decisions. I, um, I think oftentimes white people have an instinct, for example, to tell black people about their racist relatives. And uh, whenever white people start to do this, I'm like, I, I don't care about your racist grandmother. Uh, and I think one of the things that they're doing when they do that is seeking absolution. Or um, they're saying, you know, I know that racism exists, it even exists close to me, but it does not affect me. And I'm not that way, but you kind of are because you're telling me about your racist grandmother. Um, and you think that you should be getting a benediction from me because of that. And so I think we need to see more people acknowledging those kinds of behaviors and acknowledging the prejudices that they hold in terms of race, class, sexuality, gender expression, uh, you know, all of the ways in which we are different and judge people because of that. I think that does start with, you know, personal accountability. And then we have to think about what do we do to um, enact public accountability 
at, at the ballot box and in other ways. Thank you. Hello, hello, is this on? Yeah. Hello, Roxanne. My name is Loretta Ross, and I'm lucky enough. <laughs> Um, I didn't say it for that, really, I didn't. Um, I'm lucky enough to be up here in the five colleges teaching a course called White Supremacy in the Age of Trump. And I'm convinced that can only happen up here in the Pioneer Valley, where someone gets paid to teach privileged white people about white supremacy. Yeah. Um, but I have a question. One of the things that your remarks make me think of is the way that white people on the left are offering identity politics as an excuse to excuse or pass over white tribalism. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting to see what's happening on the left and uh, disgraceful as, as well. Um, white people on the left, especially those who are active in politics, are trying to add um, like uh, they're using identity politics as the offering and saying, okay, we're going to blame identity politics and get on board with Bernie Sanders and economic populism so that we can get forward and then we'll come back to you and deal with the issues that you face. You know, I, I think that the greatest disservice that has ever been done to difference and living with difference is the phrase identity politics because it allows people to dismiss really important issues and that people are so willing on the left where they're supposed to know better and be better that they're willing to throw people of color, queer people, working class people, if they're not white, under the bus just shows us that white tribalism supersedes all and white people on the left can think themselves to be incredibly progressive, but when it comes down to it, whiteness will always choose whiteness over anything else. And that's a really bitter pill to swallow. That's a really bitter pill to swallow for those of us who are liberal and leftist, and it shows us that perhaps we need to be more radical. And I struggle with that because I'm kind of a centrist. And I recognize that that has accomplished nothing. And we need something far more drastic now, especially as we continue to get thrown under the bus by our own party. Um, you know, like, how do we move forward when they say, we're going to get to you later? I'm like, no, we need to get to us now uh, because this is urgent. And we saw the same thing within feminism as a whole. And this is a reason that womanism exists because white feminists told black women and queer women, oh, we'll get to you, but right now we need to think about women as a whole. But you weren't really thinking about women as a whole. So we shouldn't be surprised by it, but I admit I was a little surprised to see these people doing this thing. But, you know, I think it's also, it shows the desperation of ambition. I think that people are so desperate to overcome what happened with Trump, that they're willing to do anything, and they still don't get that it wasn't about populism, and it was not about class or economic anxiety, which is the other nonsense phrase that came out of the election. It really was about racism, 150,000%. And if you find yourself doubting that, please just write it on a piece of paper and look at that piece of paper every moment of every single day <laughs> until November 2020. Thank you. Um, thank you. You talked about um, personal regrets that you have uh, from the months leading up to the election, and I was wondering if you went back, knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently or what would you have just done in order so that you wouldn't have had those same regrets? Oh, I would have um, just, I, I would have written far more in support of Hillary. I wrote some pieces in support of Hillary, but I didn't write nearly enough. And a lot of people were like, oh, she doesn't have policy, she doesn't do this, she doesn't do that, but she actually had really great policies. And she had those documents like widely available on her website. And so I just wish I had said more, and I wish I had spent less time trying to make, my, make sense of Bernie Sanders. 
Um, which I get, like, whatever. He's a great guy, whatever. Um, but he's a, I find him to be harmful to women. I find him harmful to people of color. And I really wish I had had the courage to say that to the kinds of people that I know would have listened. Um, because people were so taken in by his socialism, which is great, but it wasn't true socialism. It was socialism that fits his agenda. And I think that, you know, I went to high school in New England and college, and so I understand Bernie Sanders very well. And I think that when you are from Vermont, it's very easy to believe in socialism when you have a state with a very small population and a very singular population. And uh, when we saw how he was in terms of supporting anti-choice candidates, and we saw who he did and did not support in terms of candidates in lesser elections. And I just wish I had said more and done more. I just threw money at the problem and thought, oh, I, you know, I gave the max, I'm good. And I, and I wasn't, it was just, it was complacency. I really, really thought she had it in the bag. But to be fair, like a former Secretary of State can't beat a man who has never held public office. I think that side goes first. You. They just went. Okay, it's me. All right. Thank you for everything you write. Thank you. I, um, One of the issues I have is um, I'm seeing this great documentary and going and thinking, oh yeah, hey, we've had, we found a professor, wow. And, <laughs> you know, that's the ultimate goal and I'm a professor. And scholars in general have decided the linguistics of how we behave or not behave or what we teach or document or research or, you know, uh, we're the ones that decide um, how, the how we're gonna use the labs and create these discourses. I'll start with my Puerto Rican fellows. They call me a diaspora and I keep saying, no, I'm Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that's my personal debate. I'm still in the era of equal opportunity. I came here to this country in 1981. I keep thinking, how come we don't have more professors? How come we don't have 500 more professors? Uh -huh. How come we don't have 500 more students of color? Uh -huh. um, and it still goes back to well, they don't qualify. Yeah, I, I think I know where you're going with this. Like, uh, yeah, go ahead. So, <laughs> so I wanna say that when people wanna make a change, I wanna shout out for Bill Oswald who hired me as a professor when I was 25. He went to a community meeting and he said, do you wanna be, be a professor? And I said, I certainly don't know how, but sure. And I became the difficult woman on campus because I was hit by every white person there not getting what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And Bill didn't, you know, for him it was like, you didn't learn education, you didn't go to a university to study to be a professor, but you certainly have the wits and the guts. Mm -hmm to do this, and I find that it's really hard to get in Latinos yeah. to apply for these jobs and be hired. And so I, I have become that difficult person who, who we all embrace as a female. Yeah, there are a couple things going on. You know, why aren't there more faculty of color? Why aren't there more students of color? The student of color thing is that universities give a lot of lip service to it, but then don't put their money where their mouth is. Uh, it just, that's just a fact. And 
I say that as someone who teaches at a predominantly white institution and who has attended only predominantly white institutions. This problem has not changed in, I started going to college in 1996, 1992, sorry. <laughs> um, and it hasn't changed and the rhetoric is the same. And when I do these events, I do about 35 a year and I go to a campus and there's always like a little meeting before the actual main event and I meet with at least like 20 to 30 students and of those at least half or three quarters are students of color. And it gives me the impression that this is what the campus is like. And then I go to the main event <laughs> and I see that this is not what the campus is like. Um, you know, it just requires financial commitment and robust financial commitment. And you have to do what the Ivies are doing, which is you can't just bring the students there. You need to give them housing. Like, uh, you know, like your Ada Fellows. Um, you have to buy them winter coats. You have to buy them L.L. Bean boots. Those, no, they're fucking expensive. And if you are a first generation college student who has no money and you come to a place like this, and then you're expected to dress like this and be outfitted like this and you're not, I mean, you, it's not just tuition and books, it's laptop support. You have to pay for a cell phone. You have to truly support these students and until universities do that, it's not gonna change. And that affects the pipeline for faculty. But on the faculty level, it's a little more complicated because the pipeline is already there. We are out, out here earning the necessary degrees and the credentials and jumping through all of the hoops. But many universities have tenure processes that are very hostile to people of color. And um, a lot of universities are in horrible places where people of color don't want to live. And that's just being real. And it's really, really hard. I have lived in the middle of nowhere for the past 12, 13, 14, 15 years of my life. And it's, uh, I'm done. I'm just <laughs> done. And so like, how do we create safe environments within these institutions that are in Northampton or Lafayette, Indiana or Houghton, Michigan or Boise, Idaho? Until we can truly answer that question, it's going to be a real problem. It really is. Um, and also, we have to do targeted hires. Universities have to stop with the oh, search committee. No, you have to start doing tar targeted hires. It's not hard. Greetings, Roxanne, and thank you very much for coming in honor to the ancestors. My name is Pippa Fleming. 31 years ago, I was 23 years old, and Audre Lorde was standing where you are sitting, asking the exact same questions. And many people know Audre as an academic, but she was also guided. And uh, it is her cancer journals, her uh, microbiographies, where she exposes her deep aspects of her life that really transformed the work of black women and many women. She's one of the most quoted unknowns I ever heard. So my question to you is, what made you decide to go deeply personal with this book and what was that uh, defining and deciding moment? How did you handle that? Um, with Hunger, when I sold Hunger, I was thinking, what is the book I wanna write least? And um, I thought, well, the thing I definitely don't wanna do is write about fatness. And that's when I knew, oh, God damn it, I need to write about fatness. <laughs> I have often found that the thing that scares me the most ends up being the most intellectually satisfying. And the truth is that when you live in a fat body in this world, people project whatever they want onto your body and they make assumptions about the history of your body. And so I did not want to offer an explanation because I don't need to, but I still wanted to say, you know what, that's actually not the story of my body. This is the story of my body. And I wanted to take the opportunity to be able to reinscribe that story. It was very difficult. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in terms of writing. And I dragged my heels. I delayed the book for a year. I actually started writing it in, 
with, with, two, with two chapters that are accepted that I had already written previously. I started writing it in September of 2016 and finished it in February of this year. And so I wrote it fast once I actually got to writing it, but it was very difficult. And so I had very firm boundaries for myself. And the boundary was, if it doesn't relate to my body, it does not go in the book. And that made it in some ways easier. So I knew that everything I wrote about was going to be about my body because it is a memoir of my body. Um, but the harder part was actually doing the press because journalists had no earthly idea how to be tactful and talking about it. And like one NPR, not NPR, a Canadian NPR, CBC journalist um, said, so describe your body to me. <laughs> and I knew what she was trying to get me to do, which is to sort of fall into a pit of self-loathing and say something horrible about myself, but that's actually not how I see myself. And so I was fucking with her and I was like, well, I'm tall. Which is true. I'm 6'3", thank you very much. And um, it was just really hard to be asked very stupid questions um, about my body. But I'm glad it's almost over. <laughs> and I have no regrets. I know that the book has done more good than harm. And I'm proud of that. so much for being here. My name is Johanna and I am a uh, master's candidate at the Yukon School of Social Work. I'm getting my degree in community organizing. And our school is a commuter one. Most folks come off the highway, go to class, and go right back to the towns where they live in. We talk a lot in school about the idea of white fatigue. Folks who, like me, have the privilege of saying, I don't want to talk about it today. Uh, it's not interesting to me, I've heard too much about it. And then there's those of us who are literally chewing our faces off trying to say the things we want to mm -hmm. about what's happening in our world. So my question is, how do I help my friends and colleagues who are at school for altruistic reasons and want to make an impact understand that by choosing this, this phenomenon of white fatigue and choosing to leave that classroom and leave the city of Hartford behind after class, that they are helping to perpetuate this problem? By telling them that? <laughs> Just like that, huh? Just like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of conversations in the hallway, and then folks have lives outside of school. You know, everybody has something that's a hotter fire at that time. Um, yeah, I mean, you, yeah. you just have to cut through that. I mean, everybody's got lives, but you know what? Black skin go, is forever. Like, Absolutely. you know, being a woman is forever. Like, you can't, like, white people are the only people that get to opt out of difficulty and pain, broadly speaking. Everybody suffers. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> but, like, you get to walk through the world without being judged for who you are. And so it's important to confront that. But you know, I don't get confrontational with white people about privilege anymore. Because it is like, we all have privilege. And the more time, the more time that's spent, you know, like making people apologize for their privilege is time that is not spent doing the work. I think, you know, like advance the conversation. Just skip over all this twiddly dumb like, uh, and just get to the actual work. Instead of saying, stop being white fatigued, just say, here's something I need you to do. Like, give them some, like, actionable stuff that they can go do. It, just skip it. Hello, my name is Yasin. I'm Meg. And first oh my God, are you guys like a little duo? Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. we've been asking for affinity housing and this has been something that people have been asking for for decades, literally. So we want to know if you could speak on the importance of, of affinity housing on college campuses. Sure, yes. <laughs> Don't we like my little superhero friends? Yeah. You know, it's interesting, affinity housing is important. It's not for everybody. 
and that's why it should be something that some people do and some people aren't going to ever be into it. But at a universe, I'm used to universities with dorms, but on a university campus with houses, it's much different because a house is so much smaller and so more intimate. And when you live in a small and intimate environment as someone of a, who's a person of color, you are being thrown into a very shark infested pool, no matter how well intended all of you are. Um, affinity housing allows people to have a safe space to come home to after a long day of living in a hostile world. <laughs> Affinity ho housing allows people who share a common cultural practice to have space for that common cultural practice that doesn't have to be carved out every single day because it is permanently there. Affinity, affinity housing means that you get to go home and you don't have to explain who you are. You know, you shouldn't have to work when you get home from work. And that's what affinity housing oftentimes offers. It's really great to find that common ground. One of the best things about college is that you get to meet different people. And you get to interact with people from different walks of life. And traditionally, the dorm situation is something, or the housing situation is something that offers that. But when you're a person of color, everybody's different, especially in Northampton. And so you are being asked to put in labor to help white people learn about diversity on your off time when you don't have the option of affinity housing. And so I understand administratively, I'm a professor, so I have to, you know, I understand administratively why it, why it can be challenging, but in terms of humanity, if students want affinity housing and if they need it, this is not just a want, people want video games in the dorms, but you need a safe space to live in while you're getting your college education. I'll do it. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Tere. Um, I just had a question about how we point to these figures like Otelia Cromwell or even like Barack Obama when we say this is the first, how, we read, how some people read that as resolution, this is the first, we did it, we got a black president, this is the first, we did it, Otelia Cromwell was immensely successful at Smith, um, versus how we can try to read that as action, this is the first, not all black students at Smith are Otelia Cromwell. Mm -hmm. Not all black students at Smith have the challenges of Otelia Cromwell, and like not all black students at Smith are doing as well as Otelia Cromwell, and some of that is structural. And I think it applies also to like how we read other first black figures. Um, and I just was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Of course I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we will know true equality when black people are allowed to be as mediocre as white men, period. <laughs> We spend a lot of time talking about the first person to do this and that, and one thing you'll notice about first is that they are always exceptional. Do you know how exceptional Otelia Cromwell had to be to come to Smith and live way the fuck off campus? Back, you know, when she was the only one? That is a loneliness I can barely even wrap my mind around. The tenacity that you had to have back then to be a black person in a university system is unfathomable. And so what we do when we celebrate these firsts and reinforce the myth of the first is tell every underrepresented person that you need to be that exceptional and that strong to matter. And it's so harmful to people of color and underrepresented people in general. Uh, and there's also this pressure that when you're the first, you can't be the last. You have to be exceptional so that you aren't the last. And that's something I deal with every single day. Like, how do I make sure I keep this door open so some more of us come through it? And so it's important in your everyday black girl joy life to resist the temptation to try and achieve anything you don't want to achieve and to try, I mean, be the best you can be, be yourself. But don't let the system pressure you into thinking that your good enough isn't good enough, whatever that good enough might look like. And you have to find ways to resist the motives of the institution that are always trying to overlook 
just the average black kid just trying to get a college education, totally fine being a C student, doesn't want to join any clubs, just wants to be here, get in, get out, maybe go to a few parties on the weekends. That, that's what you're supposed to be able to do in college. You shouldn't have to come here and then become uh, an officer in five student organizations and uh, get straight A's and do all this. And so I also think that we have to just find, resistance sometimes is allowing ourselves to be mediocre. You know, it's not always about exceptionalism. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne, for that wonderful question and answer period. Um, at this time, we're going to ask Black Capella to come back to the stage for a rendition of No Mirrors in My Nana's House by Yase M. Bonwell. And as Black Capella comes through the to the stage, I want to mention that Black Capella was formed in the fall of 2016, and they write out of the pain and trauma of black students grappling with the current state of anti-blackness in the country. Black Capella celebrates the history of black people by singing traditional and contemporary spirituals by and for black people across the diaspora, using music to inspire faith, healing, community, and activism. And its mission is first to empower black students through song and secondly, to use their collective voices to engage the larger community in the fight for black life. Hashtag Black Lives Matter always. Give it up for Black Capella members. Pushing my feet and the beauty in everything, yeah, I was in her eyes. Oh. Like the rising of the sun was in her eyes. Oh. I'm telling you, there were no mirrors in my dad's house. No mirrors in my dad's in the house. And the beauty that I saw in everything, the beauty in everything, yeah, I was in her eyes. Oh. Like the rising of the sun was in her eyes. was a magical place. I only knew love and I didn't know hate. And the beauty in everything, yeah, I was in her eyes. Like the rising of the sun was in her eyes. I'm telling you, there were no mirrors in my nana's house. No mirrors in my nana's house. I still want to introduce him. 
Adriana Valerio, Ada Comstock, class of 2018 founder. Kai Shirley, class of 2019 musical director. Yolanda Watson, class of 2018 Jay. Tierra Austin, class of 2018. Nibraria. Nibraria Acklin, class of 2018. Chanel White, class of 2021. Julie Destiny, class of 2021. All right now. Ava Dujan, class of 2021. And Olivia Baldwin, class of 2021. Black Capella! Yes! out of time, but I just want to thank everyone for attending Atelier Cromwell Day. Thank you so much to our keynote speaker, Roxanne Gay. Yes. And special appreciation for funding from the Mary H. Collette 1925 Symposium Fund. Please join us for workshops and activities listed in the program. Workshops begin at 2.45 p.m. and 4.10 p.m. Have a wonderful afternoon and evening. Enjoy.